On the map of Spain, it's Puerto de Santa Maria. But to the people who live around here, the part of southern Spain which turns the corner into the Atlantic, it is simply the port, Puerto. They see no need for further identification. Ptolemy, who mentioned the port a couple of thousand years ago, would have been puzzled by our Austin 1100. But Puerto's main export, the splendid wines of the Jerez district, which we call Sherry, would have been as happily familiar to him as they are to us. Anne and I had come to see the people and the places which have been producing and shipping those wines since long before Ptolemy. British visitors are always welcome, and not only because we buy something like 70% of Spain's sherry exports, about six million gallons a year. And we can visit in rather more comfort than Ptolemy could have done. All the way to Jerez, we're driving through vineyard country. Spaniards are amongst the most hospitable people in the world, so you can't feel like a stranger anyway. But if you already know someone there, so much the better. Anne's friend Maria greeted us in the true Spanish way. Mi casa es su casa. My house is your house. She took us first through Jerez itself, in full, Jerez de la Frontera, on the way to Arcos, which is also de la Frontera puzzling because the nearest frontier is a hundred miles away. But back in the Middle Ages, this was the frontier between Moorish and Christian Spain. The Moors have gone 700 years ago, but the names have stayed. Arcos was very much de la frontera during the Moorish wars, a frontline town with a turbulent existence. The castle which we visited with Maria wasn't the first. Back in Roman times, Arcos was already a military stronghold perched on top of a 200-foot-high limestone ridge. Today, not fortifications, but new hotels take advantage of the splendid view. Outside Arcos, one of Maria's favorite restaurants, the Molinera, where the food is first class. If this were a tourist-packed area like the Costa Brava, you probably couldn't get in without booking days ahead. Frankly, Anne and I don't know why it isn't tourist-packed. This particular spot, for instance, has a lake and a storybook paddle steamer called Mississippi. All this and good food ashore. You'd expect it to look like Blackpool in August. You would also, being like Anne and me, humanly selfish. Thank heaven that it wasn't. in England was never like this anyway, and it's well into September already. September's a good time to visit the Hereth vineyards, because it's the month of the grape harvest. A good time to see how the district's hundred or more bodegas, wine lodges, perform their professional magic. Harvest or not, El Patron himself isn't too busy to show round to explain things, and of course, when the time comes, to help us sample his own product. The range of sherry is so great that the locals very wisely use it for all occasions, drinking little else. But the stranger, if he has several bodegas to visit, will be wise to keep some of his capacity in reserve. The Duke of Windsor, then Prince of Wales, was one of many royal visitors to have signed sherry casks at our next bodega. And many of the casks are a lot older than that. Sherry in the bottle is never dated like a claret or a burgundy because it's always a blend of the wine of different years. For each year's harvest, the coopers of Jerez make new casks in the traditional manner, softening the wood by heat before they hammer the iron hoops into place for a perfect seal. Nobody knows at this stage just what quality and flavor of wine the harvest will make. Months of fermentation in those barrels, at first violent, then slow, lie ahead before the blenders can begin to judge it. This is a solera, where wines of various years are stored, with the youngest on top. This one was designed by Eiffel, the tower builder, especially for a visit of the Queen of Spain. And this gentleman is called Evanen Theodore, 
the stick is whalebone, the cup is silver, and the trick is impossible. Some Benentheodores can fill as many as 18 glasses at a time without spilling a drop. There's no particular reason for that. The achievement's its own justification. There's no particular reason for this either. Dedicating casks to famous people who visit a bodega, who have some connection with the place, is a pleasant custom around here. That one is General Franco's. British names you'll find here include Fleming, discoverer of penicillin, and the Beatles. The Hereth area isn't only famous as the home of Sherry. It has great ranches which breed some of the best fighting bulls in all Spain. Maria arranged for us to visit one of these ranches. Though whether she also arranged for the guard of honor to receive us, we never found out. Maria herself was there before us, in full Andalusian riding habit, with black sombrero and tooled leather chaps. I felt very inadequate not being a horseman myself. Everyone here is practically born on horseback. But Spaniards are too polite to allow you to feel at a disadvantage, and Maria is no exception. These bulls are bred only for fighting, but no bull is trained for it. He enters the ring with nothing but his great strength and his small wits. Brave boys who hope to become toreros one day sometimes climb over the ranch fence on a moonlight night with a cloak and try their hand at playing a bull. They're in trouble if they're caught because this spoils the bull by giving him practice too and teaching him what to expect. It would be interesting to know how many of these toreros began their careers with such moonlight trespassing. Today's corrida, like almost every other event at this time of year, is in honor of the wine harvest fiesta. El Cordobez, Spain's most famous and highest paid matador, studies the first bull. El Cordobez is a public hero today, but he too began by climbing fences in the moonlight. In the place of honor, this year's vintage queen and her court. Another wine harvest event is the annual horse show at the military stud farm in Jerez where the army's Arab mounts are bred and trained. But many of the entries, both horses and carriages, are privately owned. This is a traditionally Andalusian turnout, unchanged for centuries. or to be correct, ponies, polo ponies. Polo was introduced to Spain through the Jerez area, and it's very popular amongst the prosperous bodega-owning families. The ponies come from South America, and importing them isn't cheap either. But the ancient dynasties of these vineyards aren't ashamed of their wealth. They live up to it with style, working hard and playing hard. Jose Ignacio Domecq, in the white shirt, is head of such a family, and an internationally known polo player. 
he has 12 children and claims to be the only man in the world who can field a family polo team. The gate of Cardiff is its only land entrance because Cardiff is practically an island. It's on the rocky tip of a long spit of sand. Phoenician merchants saw the advantages of the place 3,000 years ago and it's been going strong ever since, especially after Christopher Columbus and all that. Every house is whitewashed every year, which certainly adds to the cheerful and welcoming atmosphere. But one of the biggest attractions of Cardiff for visitors and Spaniards is the five mile long bathing beach. Many connoisseurs consider it the finest in Spain, which is saying something. Our friend Jose Ignacio is a yachtsman too, as well as a wine producer and polo player. And so are many of his fellow sherry barons, on that same principle of working hard and playing hard. It was the huge natural harbor of the Bay of Cadiz 30 miles around, which first attracted the Phoenicians. And it was here, some time later, that Drake singed the King of Spain's beard by burning every ship in the bay and then carrying off hundreds of casks of sherry as booty. Anne and I found that this little incident is no longer held against English visitors. This is San Lucar de Barameda, the little fishing port from which Columbus set out on his third voyage to America. From here too, Magellan sailed to prove the world was round, taking 352 casks of sherry with him to ease the journey. Today, San Lucar is best known as the home of Manzanilla, driest and palest sherry of all. Manzanilla has a slightly salty tang which comes from the sea air during the maturing, not the growing. San Lucar wines taken inland to mature lose this tang, and inland ones matured at San Lucar acquire it. A vineyard's well is very important at harvest time. The shuttle service of water for the vineyard workers, carried in pots which haven't changed since the Romans were here, is a must, because the temperature in the vineyards can be up to 110 in the shade, if there were any shade, except under those hats. Two kinds of grapes are grown in the Jerez area, the white Palomino and the black Pedro Jimenez. The majority are Palominos like these, providing the dry element. The Pedro Jimenez, fortified with brandy, give whatever degree of sweetening is required. Britain, the biggest foreign customer, has a notoriously sweet tooth. The Spaniards themselves prefer little or no sweetening. It seems to be a rule that the hotter the country, the drier the standard of public taste, though there are enough exceptions to cast doubt on that too. But whatever your taste, you name it, Hereth can meet it. Immediately after gathering, the grapes are spread on mats of espato grass in the sun. The longer they're left, the more the sugar content builds up. The white palominos stay on the mats about 24 hours. The black grapes are left much longer, till they're almost raisins. This is a sample room. Each of these bottles is a particular sherry for a particular customer, with its blending formula on the label so that it can be exactly repeated. But of course it's not as simple as that, because each cask from each year's harvest is different. So as the years go by, the blending must be altered to reproduce the original result. Thanks to lifelong experts like this man, when you buy a sherry with a given label, you can rely on its tasting exactly like the last one you bought, and being the same color. Another problem for the blender. All this of course means keeping huge reserves of wine of various years in store, and the Spaniard's willingness to tie up immense capital in this way is one of the things that makes real sherry what it is. The reserves held maturing in Jerez really are huge. It's been said that if they were all released at once, they could intoxicate the whole human race. The park area of Jerez is like Rotten Row in the time of Oscar Wilde. One goes there to be seen. Every day of the fiesta, the young caballeros parade with their flamenco-clad girls.
Sherry being part of all social life, one does not dismount for it. All this is so traditional, you might be forgiven for thinking the Herethanos despised anything new. But you'd be wrong. For example, Hereth was the first city in Europe to plan a railway, as early as 1827. September means the wine harvest, and the wine harvest means fiesta. And fiesta means that all the stops are pulled out. For the big carnival parade, every bodega of reasonable size likes to have a float on show, which puts quite a strain on even Herod's plentiful supply of pretty girls. King Ferdinand traditionally has a place in the parade, and of course his consort, Queen Isabella. The Bodega San Hino is a sort of municipal wine museum to which are taken samples of wine from each bodega. And there they will stay for all time. In front of the collegiate church of Herod, the year's vintage queen carries the first tray of grapes for the ceremony from which the whole fiesta springs, the blessing of the harvest. When the grapes have been blessed by the priest, they are carried to the wine press, watched over by San Hinas de la Jara, patron saint to the vineyards. After the vintage queen has carried the first tray of grapes, her maids of honor follow with more and more for the blessing and the wine press. One thing the organizers of the Fiesta de la Vendimia, the festival of the vintage, do not have to ensure against is bad weather. They know what the weather will be like. Hereth averages 295 days of sunshine in the year and 70 days of rain. Both, of course, are necessary for a good grape harvest, but the 70 days of rain come tidily and predictably at the right time of year. And this isn't it. of Spain smiles when the first juice of Hereth starts to flow. And at the critical moment, hundreds of pigeons are released to carry the glad news to every corner of the country. Meanwhile, in the Lagar, the wine press, the juice is being won in the traditional manner. Nowadays, in most bodegas, the pressing is mechanical. And though it may sadden the romantics, the machines do the job better. But for ceremonial occasions, old ways are more fitting. long in the bodega gardens, the flamenco dancers stamp and weave in honor of the vintage, as they have done throughout the centuries, and will go on doing, as long as Spanish grapes ripen in the sun.